Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with a news item on page number one of the Delhi edition of The Hindu, relevant for GS paper two, Iraqi MPs vote to expel US troops. Now this is in reaction to the killing of the top military commander of Iran, Qasem Soleimani. Qasem Soleimani was killed in a US drone strike in Baghdad, the capital of Iraq. Now in response, the Iraqi parliament has called on the government of Iraq to work to end all foreign troop presence in the country. But why are US troops stationed in Iraq? For that, let's go back to the September 11 attacks on United States, popularly called as the 9-11 attacks. In 2001, Al-Qaeda launched these attacks on United States in which more than 3,000 innocent civilians lost their lives. In response to these attacks, the US President George W. Bush, what he did? He asked the Afghanistan government that you should hand over Osama bin Laden to us because Osama bin Laden, the founder of Al-Qaeda responsible for 9-11 attacks was hiding in Afghanistan. Afghanistan then was controlled by Taliban. Taliban refused to hand over Osama bin Laden to United States. And ultimately what happened? In October 2001, US attacked Afghanistan. In his presidential address, George W. Bush also talked about something called axis of evil. Those countries which are sponsoring terrorism, patronizing terrorism and also in possession of weapons of mass destruction. And three countries made up this axis. Three countries, one Iran, Iraq and North Korea. Iraq was alleged to be in possession of weapons of mass destruction and United States and her allies decided in the year 2003 that now is the time to launch a war on Iraq because Iraq is in possession of weapons of mass destruction and Iraq is a threat to United States as well as the allies of the United States. Iraq then was ruled by a dictator, Saddam Hussein. Even before the Iraq war, Saddam Hussein had allowed the international agencies such as IAEA to visit Iraq and check whether Iraq is in possession of weapons of mass destruction. No conclusive evidence was taken whether Iraq is in possession of weapons of mass destruction or not. But nevertheless, US and her allies went ahead and launched a war on Iraq. Saddam Hussein's government was dethroned. Saddam Hussein was captured alive and then he was hanged. After the war was over, no weapons of mass destruction were found in Iraq. But what this war did, it transformed Iraq from a stable government, from a stable country and transformed it into a den of instability. And it is this instability that was also because of the sectarian clashes between the Shias, the majority of Iraq and the Sunnis. For most of its history, after the independence of Iraq in the 1930s, Iraq was ruled by the Sunnis. Saddam Hussein was a Sunni. But when the Iraq war got over, Saddam Hussein was captured and hanged. There were series of elections in Iraq which led to civilian governments in Iraq and Shias came to dominate the democratic polity of Iraq. Till 2014, Nuri al-Maliki was the head of the government in Iraq and many people allege that it is his government that is responsible for widening gulf between the Shias and the Sunnis. But closer to 2009, the then US President Barack Obama decided to pull out US troops from Iraq. But then something else happened. The instable Iraq gave birth to a terrorist organization, ISIS. And to fight ISIS, US troops continued to remain in Iraq. Close to 5,000 US troops are there in Iraq. But most of them are in advisory capacity. They are supporting the Iraqi police, how to fight Islamic State, how to fight other terrorist organizations such as Al-Qaeda. That is why US troops are still present in some numbers in Iraq. Now because of the killing of Qasem Soleimani, 
who was the top military commander of Iran. And Iran is also a Shia-dominated country. So that is why Iraqi MPs have voted to expel US troops because according to them, since ISIS has now been defeated, there is no reason for US troops to continue on the soil of Iraq. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at another news on page number one, disturbing news from Jawaharlal Nehru University in Delhi. Masked men and women who were armed with sticks and stones, they beat teachers and students and vandalized property at the university. This is a very disturbing news. Who is responsible for this? We don't know. Now in all our video lectures, we try and appear non-partisan. We don't pick sides. But here it's very difficult for us not to pick a side because at the end of the day, these were the students and teachers who were thrashed. Even if you disagree with the ideology of the students of the JNU or any other university, violence is not a solution. There should be absolutely no place for violence in a democratic and civilized societies. Who is responsible for these attacks? We don't know. But who has incited this violence, we know for sure. And unfortunately, that is the media. When students were protesting at JNU, at Jamia University, Aligarh Muslim University, Jadhapur University, Hyderabad University, the television news channels at 9 o'clock every night, they would call these students internationals, part of Tugaday Tugaday Gang. And it is this ideology of the mass media that is responsible for inciting these mobs. There is a code of conduct for media to regulate themselves, but it is high time that this code of conduct is reformed so that media is not in a position to incite people to violence. The job of the media is to portray facts, is to present both sides of the picture. But media should not act as a jury and decide who is a nationalist and who is international and then incite people to violence. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at another news on page number one, relevant for prelims. On January 2, we discussed Gaganyaan, which is India's first manned mission to space. The mission is scheduled for 2022. The mission, four astronauts, they have been selected. Four Indian Air Force pilots have been selected and they will be trained in Russia. But why not in India? Because we lack facilities. Now the ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization, it has proposed a 2700 crore plan to create infrastructure to set up facilities where in future training of the crew will take place in India. This world class center, this world class center to be named Human Space Flight Center will be set up at Chalakeri in Karnataka. Once this facility is set up, then we don't have to pay hefty amount of money to other countries for using these facilities. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at another news on page number 8. Citizenship Amendment Act is now the law of the land. A law passed by the parliament. Parliament consists of the President of India, Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha. NPR or National Population Register has also been approved by the Union Cabinet. There are several states which have categorically stated that they are not going to implement Citizenship Amendment Act. Few states such as West Bengal and Kerala, they have also halted the NPR exercise. Here in this newspaper article, a minister is saying if states do not implement Citizenship Amendment Act, President's rule under Article 356 can be imposed in these states. Is it possible? Let's try and answer this question. There are two obligations on part of the states. What are these two obligations? Number one, whenever a law is passed by the parliament, it is the responsibility of the states to implement those laws. It is the responsibility of the states to comply with those laws. Second obligation, it is the obligation on part of the state government that whenever central government is doing something, exercising its executive functionality, and if the state government is interfering 
or impeding with the legitimate functions of the central government, then in both these cases, what will happen? Directions can be issued by the central government to the states that you will have to comply with the central law that you will not have to interfere with the functioning or the executive powers of the central government. The directions are coercive in nature. That means even after issuing these directives, if the state government does not follow these directions, then it can be assumed that there is a breakdown of constitutional machinery, then president's rule can be imposed in these states. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at another news on page number nine. It deals with Saras. Saras is India's first indigenous light transport aircraft. It is designed by NAL or National Aerospace Laboratory. This NAL was established by the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in the year 1959. Can be an important statement for your prelims exam. Initially, it was headquartered in Delhi, but in 1960, the headquarter was shifted to Bengaluru. NAL works closely with Hindustan Aeronautics Limited, Defense Research and Development Organization, and Indian Space Organization. What is the prime responsibility of NAL? The prime responsibility is developing civilian aircraft in India. And NAL has developed and designed Saras, which is India's first light transport aircraft. The first prototype of Saras flew in the year 2004. Later, it was reported by newspapers that the project has been cancelled. But in 2017, the project was revived. Now, NAL has told the Parliamentary Committee on Science and Technology that in order to give push to Saras, government should be the launch customer of these aircrafts. That means the central government should buy at least 50 to 60 Saras aircrafts so that this project can become commercially viable. And these aircrafts can be used under Udan scheme, which is a regional connectivity scheme of the government of India. These aircrafts can also be used for VIP services as well. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper article. Now let's look at some of the editorials and columns from today's newspaper. First up, scoring a foreign policy self goal written by Professor Happy Mon Jacob, who teaches at JNU Delhi. This is similar to the column written by Suhasini Heather on January 2, 2020, in which the author says that the actions of the government on Article 370, as well as on Citizenship Amendment Act, these are like foreign policy self goals. Happy Mon Jacob argues, when was the last time we heard a mention of rising India? When was the last time a foreign government said we back India's permanent membership of United Nations Security Council? Because now Indian diplomats are busy trying to explain to the world leaders, trying to explain to the international powers, why did we revoke the special status of Jammu and Kashmir? Why are we bringing about Citizenship Amendment Act? Why are we trying to roll out national registry of citizens in this country? Happy Mon Jacob argues that if the objective of the government is that refugees from three countries who have been persecuted because of their religion, if the objective of the government is to provide citizenship to these refugees, then there was no need for Citizenship Amendment Act. Instead, the need was to have a refugee law in this country. And this refugee law should have been non-discriminatory as well. Because of all these decisions, the author argues that India's reputation has taken a hit. We may lose our friends like Bangladesh and Afghanistan. And that is why all our diplomats are busy in dousing the fires lit by these decisions of the government. And that is why we are not in a position to decide whether we should join RCEP or not. What is going to be India's role in Afghan peace process? And whether India should join US, Japan and Australia in launching a front against China in Indian Ocean region so that India can assert its diplomatic power in the neighborhood. That is what this newspaper column is all about. Now let's look at one editorial, Life of Science. But first, a few details about Indian Science Congress. Indian Science Congress 
is India's premier scientific organization. Its headquarter is in Kolkata. It was set up in the year 1914. The meetings of Indian Science Congress are held annually in the first week of January. Can be an important statement for your prelims examination. There are more than 30,000 scientists who are the members of Indian Science Congress. And what is the objective of Indian Science Congress? To promote, to advance the cause of science in India. Because let's not forget, part 4A of the constitution talks about fundamental duties. And one such fundamental duty is to promote scientific temper. But of late, Indian Science Congress has been at the center of controversy. For example, last year, a scientist said that Korvas were born using stem cell technology. Andhra Pradesh University Vice Chancellor last year said that Ravan had 24 types of aircraft. A professor from Tamil Nadu said, I hold a degree in renewable energy, but there is no such department as renewable energy. In 2016, a Nobel laureate of Indian origin, Venkat Raman Ramakrishnan said, I am not going to participate in Indian Science Congress meetings since it is a circus. There are people who say Indian Science Congress is nothing but comedy. For example, a minister last year said that Stephen Hawking has accepted that the theories that are mentioned in Vedas are superior than Einstein's theory of relativity. One member at the meeting of Indian Science Congress last year said that Darwin's theory of evolution is scientifically wrong. Indian Express last year wrote that in India today, if stand-up comedians say anything which is critical of the government or the members of the ruling party, then they are arrested. So Indian Express wrote, which means in India, we take comedy too seriously and science today has now become comedy. That is what this editorial also talks about. It says that the Science Congress needs new ideas and not the mix of myth and pseudoscience. That is what you need to understand from this editorial. Now let's look at another column on page number 10. There is a trade war going on between United States and China. In July 2018, US imposed tariffs on Chinese goods. China retaliated by imposing tariffs on the US goods. Now there are reports that maybe a trade deal between United States and China may be signed in January this year. There is already a phase one of this trade deal in operation where United States said that we are not going to impose further sanctions on Chinese goods. We are not going to impose further tariffs on the Chinese goods. But China has to buy US products. And United States also said that we are going to roll back some of these tariffs imposed on the Chinese goods. But now this trade war has entered into the era of artificial intelligence, digital space and 5G. US has already banned Huawei, which is world's number one telecom supplier. Why? On the charges of intellectual property theft, on the charges of espionage. That means through Huawei technologies, China is spying on United States. US is also pressurizing other countries not to involve Huawei in 5G field trials, but India has allowed Huawei for 5G trials. This column says, despite the trade war between US and China, India has not benefited. Instead, countries like Taiwan, countries like Mexico, countries like Vietnam, European Union countries have benefited. The column says that trade war was an opportunity for India to bridge the trade deficit with China. Because in the year 2018-2019, the trade deficit between India and China was $53.56 billion. That means we import more from China than China imports from us. China, for example, is facing acute shortage of pork because of swine flu. But India's meat, particularly buffalo meat, it reaches China, but through Vietnam and Philippines, which means that the costs are pushed up. That means India's exported meat is not competitive in the Chinese market. 
India's pork exports are also very meager. This column says, however, the Chinese rivalry with United States, it presents a strategic movement for India. Because if there is a downfall in the US-China relationship, at the same time, there is an upward trajectory in India-US relation. This is a movement for India to seize. For example, there is Belt and Road Initiative of China. India is not part of it. There is RCEP. India has not signed RCEP. There is also Indo-Pacific Business Forum created by US, Japan and Australia. India is not part of it. There is Blue Dot Network, which is a network of United States, Japan and Australia, where they want to construct infrastructure in the Indo-Pacific region. India is also not part of this Blue Dot Network. So this column basically says that India has to now seize the right movement because if there is a rivalry between United States and China, this movement should be seized by India so that in Asia, India can counter China as another superpower in the region. That is what you need to understand from this newspaper column. Now let's look at two columns on page number 11 relevant for your general awareness. Those who will be appearing for civil services examination interview, this can be a potential question asked by the panel. When students were protesting against Citizenship Amendment Act, National Registry of Citizens, the assault on students at Jamia Millia University, the students took out protest marches and some of them also read the poem of Faiz Ahmad Faiz, Hum Dekhenge. When the students at IIT Kanpur read this poem, a faculty at IIT Kanpur lodged a complaint and said, this poem is anti-Hindu, it is also anti-national. A committee was set up to probe whether this poem is anti-national or anti-Hindu as well. Although IIT Kanpur later on clarified that our committee is not going to investigate whether this poem is anti-Hindu, but it has generated a lot of controversy. And let's understand this newspaper column in slight detail. Faz Ahmad Faz is one of the most renowned Urdu poets. He is in the category of Mir Taki Mir, Lama Iqbal and Ghalib. But Faz is also different from them. Faz is not like Ghalib and Mir because both of them were involved in romantic poetry. Iqbal was more into religion. His poetry represents more of Islamic philosophy. But Faiz was a revolutionary poet. He wrote his famous poem, Mujse Pahli Si Mohabbat Mere Mehboob Namang. Now you might argue that this is a romantic poem, but it is not. In fact, he wrote this poem when Faiz read the Communist Manifesto written by Karl Marx and his friend Frederick Engels. Faiz was also against the division of the country on religious lines. When General Ziaul Haq imposed martial law in Pakistan, suspended the constitution of Pakistan, Faiz was highly critical of Ziaul Haq and he had to spend some time in jail as well. In 1979, Faiz Ahmad Faiz wrote, Hum dekhenge, lazim hai ki hum bhi dekhenge. We shall see, we are destined to see. What was he talking about? He was talking about social justice. Critics argue that in his poem, Hum Dekhenge, he is talking about Annal Haq and he is talking about the rule of the men of God. That is why it is Islamic fundamentalism, it is anti-Hindu and that is why this poem should be banned. But the columnist argues that when he writes Annal Haq and the rule of the men of God, it is against Ziaul Haq. Because he wanted people to revolt against the Islamic fundamentalism of Ziaul Haq and ensure social justice in the society. So this poem cannot be anti-Hindu, cannot be Islamic fundamentalism. Here Paneer Selvam, who is the reader's editor of the Hindu, he talks about his personal experiences in Nepal. When in Nepal, the King Gayandri, he dismissed the government and imposed absolute monarchy. It was then that civil society activists, journalists and writers, they protested against the king by singing the poems of Faiz Ahmad Faiz. And they were singing Faiz Ahmad Faiz's most rendered poem, Bol. Bol ki lab azad hai tere. Bol ki zuba ab tak teri hai. Speak your lips are free. Speak your tongue is still yours. And later on democracy was restored in Nepal. So the writer says, if Faiz can help restore democracy in Nepal, he can do so in India too. You may agree or disagree with the writings of both the columnists, but that is what you need to understand from this article. 
Now let's look at practice questions. First up, prelims based questions. Which of the following were commissioned by Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb? Bibi ka Makbara, yes. Moti Masjid, which is inside Lal Kila, Red Fort in Delhi. Both were commissioned by Mughal Emperor Aurangzeb. So both the statements are correct. Although some historians say that Bibi ka Makbara was actually built by the son of Aurangzeb, but nevertheless, it was commissioned by Aurangzeb. Money was provided by Aurangzeb. So both these are correct. What is the context? Because the marble domes of Bibi ka Makbara, which is in Maharashtra, it is going to get a new glow. Archaeological Survey of India is to carry out scientific conservation of the monument. Let's look at another question. Which of the following is or are correctly matched? Space Agency and the country. NASA, United States, correct. Roscosmos, Russia, correct. CNES, France, correct. All the statements are correct. Drosophila, recently seen in news, is most widely used and preferred model organisms in biological research. What is the context? Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research is organizing the fifth edition of Asia Pacific Drosophila Research in Pune. And this is for the first time that such conference is organized in the country. Prelims based question 2019, which one of the following is not a sub index of the World Bank's ease of doing business? World Bank releases a report ease of doing business and ranks countries on the basis of ease of doing business. So which of the following is not a sub index? Maintenance of law and order is not a sub index. There are 10 sub indices. These are the 10 sub indices on the basis of which World Bank ranks the countries on ease of doing business. Starting a business, dealing with construction permits, getting electricity, registering property, getting credit, protecting investors, paying taxes, trading across the borders, enforcing contracts, resolving insolvency. It's on the basis of these 10 sub indices that World Bank releases the report. Let's look at mains based questions. As US Iran tension rises, India will have to balance its ties with all parties. India's economic and strategic interests will take a hit if there is any further instability or tension in the region. Comment. There are a few key points that you can mention in your answers. One immediate consequence of the flaring up of tension in West Asia is that India finds itself in a very difficult position giving it strong relations with, with all the key players. For example, US and Israel are preeminent strategic partners for India. Saudi Arabia and Iraq, they are crucial for India's energy security. But Iran is also central to India's plan to access Afghanistan and Central Asia where the, where the Chabahar port. And in West Asia, there are close to 8 million Indians who are working in West Asia. So any rising tension between Iran and United States is going to affect India as well. Another question, internet shutdowns are sinister as they do not directly impinge upon the rights of the people to mobilize or protest, but they reduce the inherent capacity of people to collectivize, critically analyze. That is it from our newspaper analysis for today. Thank you for being with us. Have a great day.